Well, welcome everybody. Um, as Elizabeth said, tonight we're going to talk about brick walls and busting through them. And Elizabeth and I will both be kind of chatting about this at different points in the talk um, and going over a little PowerPoint that shows that some of the brick walls that we had submitted to us that we are going to talk over, like how we would attempt to solve them. So we're giving you suggestions and hopefully there'll be universal suggestions that will help all of you, even if we're not talking about your particular brick wall. Now, for those of you who did submit a brick wall on Facebook, you should go back to that post because we have answered all of the brick walls on Facebook as well. Um, and we have posted some suggestions for each of you. So do that if you haven't done that already. Okay, what's a brick wall? Well, real quick, is a difficult question that you've been unable to answer. And there could be a variety of reasons. I put some of them on the screen that may not be your particular situation, but a lot of them are for these various reasons that we have on the screen here. Now, a lot of this is in your handout. So I did do kind of an extensive handout on how to um, approach different kinds of brick walls. And so please do refer to the handout. Um, but first of all, I think you ought to have, these are the kind of positive research attitudes that I have about getting my um, brick walls, going, getting over my brick walls. So you wanna be exhaustive and look everywhere at all types of record resources. Um, be creative. If you think that you've looked everywhere, take some time off, regroup, and then look again some more. And be persistent, never ever give up. Then we have some kind of processes that you could go through. And if you go through these processes, you will know so much more about your ancestors and about their lives that it will help you along the way in trying to solve brick walls about this particular ancestor family. So if you make it a point of studying the lives of your ancestor, his or her entire family and their fan club, which is the friends, associates, and neighbors, from birth to death and kind of make a timeline maybe of all the records that you have found for the different family members, that will help you. Um, if you become an expert on the localities where the family live, that will help you. On um, the history, the geography, um, that type of thing. Become an expert on the records created in that locality and time period and where, where you can access them today, who has the records and become an expert on any kind of interesting life circumstances that the family had, such as a specific illness that befell the family like tuberculosis or a war that a family member might've fought in because different records are gonna be created for those specific situations and you wanna know about those as well. Okay, so there's my little pep talk for you. <laughs> um, Let's go over some of the brick walls that we had submitted to us. And we're gonna give you advice on how to solve them. So first of all, there's a lot of brick walls that may revolve around names, spelling variations, transcription issues. And this one, I feel, oh yeah, here we go. Um, so you, one of the ways you wanna to try to overcome that um, is to search in different online databases. Don't restrict yourself to just one because um, they're all gonna have different transcriptions of the records going on. And so that will help you. You need to make a list of alternate spellings of the surname, sound it out phonetically and make a list of, of different ways that you might spell it if you didn't really know how to spell it, but you were sounding it out. For first names, I've seen people listed in records using a nickname, a middle name, their initials, abbreviations such as THOS for Thomas, et cetera. Use the search options in the database that will allow you to truncate, use wildcards, um, Boolean searching, maybe sound decks and other types of things like that, that help you search um, for alternative spellings and such. So here's our first one. Okay. 
So uh, this question says, I am looking for the parents of Evelyn Justice. She is on my, my husband's side. I've been working on this mystery for the past year and I would greatly appreciate any help that could be given. I keep hitting brick walls. She was raised by her grandmother, name unknown, until the age of five when she was adopted by a family in Colorado named Pearsons. From her diary, we believe she may have traveled to Colorado on the orphan train. The above is her birth name. Her birth date was 1909 in uh, Minnesota. She stated, as she stated on the census, and she died in 1977 in California, and she married Chester Kunston in 1925. Okay, so this is an interesting um, question for a variety of reasons. We've got an adoption. We've got, you know, mysterious grandmother that we don't know. Um, we've got a child that actually was adopted quite late. Um, this is not an infant adoption. Um, it's a supposedly a five-year-old adoption. So that makes me wonder about what could have happened in the family's life at that point in time that caused her to be given up for adoption. The most exciting thing that I see here other than, well, there's, there's some adoption records that could be looked at, but she should be listed in, in a census. So she's born in 1909 in Missouri. She should be in the 1910 census. And who, who is she living in that census with is my question. She's not adopted yet, according to the family story. So is she living with relatives? Is she living in an orphanage or foster home? You know, what's happening with her? And when we do a search for Evelyn Justice, we don't come up with anything. So I did some creative searching. And so here's what I did at Ancestry. And so these are using the search options at Ancestry. Um, I used the truncation, which is the asterisk. If you can see it there, I did truncation on both the first and the last name. So I did EVE asterisk and then JUST asterisk. And that's going to get any name that begins with E-V-E, -E, including E. So it doesn't have to have any letters after that, but it could have letters after that. Same thing with justice. It would come up with the last name just or justice or any other name that began with the letters J-U-S-T. I also put in Missouri as the place where the ancestor might've lived. I could take that out if I don't get anywhere. You should really experiment with with these search screens and do little tweaks on your search and see how it affects your search results. That will help you. I also put in the birth year of 1909 plus or minus two years. That's actually gonna search for births from 1907 to 1911, which should cover most variations in age, but you could also in Ancestry do plus or minus five years, 10 years and one year. So then I did match all terms exactly right here with the green button so that it will do exactly what I just told it to do here. It'll do all the truncation that I asked for, the Missouri and the 1909 plus or minus two years. When I did that, I came up with a really intriguing entry that I think shows a lot of promise. It's an Evelyn Justine. So we have one letter off between Justice and Justine. And so I wondered, is this the result of a transcription error? Um, did the person who was looking at the actual handwriting, were they unable to, to really determine what the, what the handwriting said? And so they made a judgment that it was Justine, but could it really be justice? So I pulled it up and I have shown it there at the bottom right. And to me, it looks a little scribbly around the very last part of the name could be Justice, could be Justine. And you've got a mother and a father, Eli, Lula, and a child named Evelyn, who is two. And they and she's from Missouri. She's born in Missouri and they're living in Denver, Colorado. So you wanna take this as a possibility and you wanna research it further. And so I went to the Denver Public Library's website, which has a lot of good material on there for genealogy and local history involving um, de the Denver area and they had an obituary index. And I looked for people named Justice or Justine, either, either last name. And 
lo and behold, I see that a Lulu justice died in 1913. So in my view, this is a possible solution that we've found her, the family in that 1910 census and the mother dies in 1913 and that precipitates the child being adopted. That would be typical of the time period. Single fathers didn't always keep their small children. They were unable to do so really with needing to work and make money and support the family. So um, this would be a typical kind of thing to have happen if the mother were to pass away. So there's more that can be done here to prove this. Um, ordering the pre-adoption birth certificate from Missouri is a possibility because Missouri and Colorado are actually open record states as far as adoption goes. Um, order those obituaries from the Denver Public Library for Lulu and see if they are the same woman that we think that they are. And order Lulu's death certificate from the state of Colorado. Continue researching the possible parents and look at autosomal DNA also of the descendants to see if those lead you to the right family. Okay, now we have disappearing ancestors. And lots of disappearing ancestors could go, you know, could be for a lot of different reasons. Death, moving, changing name due to marriage, changing name due to Americanizing the name of an immigrant, changing name due to running from the law, um, institutionalized due to illness, crime, or poverty. So we have a number of brick walls that were submitted to us that were um, disappearances. So this first one uh, is for death information. Uh, it says, I'm searching for the burial location of Maddie Heath Mumford, who died in 1913. She died on the same day her daughter Maddie Mumford was born. Maddie Heath Mumford was married to James Taylor Mumford in 1904. He remarried and is buried with his second wife in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma. Okay, so this question kind of, it could go in a lot of different directions. We don't know exactly what kind of research that this person has already done on this question. They don't really specify that they've looked here, here, and here, and here. So I'm assuming that they have looked everywhere for this information and it's just not been found, but that may not be true. I have a whole section in the handout about finding death information about um, your ancestor. And so I would suggest that this person go through that to be sure that they have covered all the bases. Um, but if they've looked in the local cemeteries already, they've, they've um, checked for a death record, an obituary, that kind of thing, and they still haven't been able to find where Maddie was buried, then there may be some, unfortunately, that this is going to be a brick wall that may not be solved. Um, if she was buried on the family property, there may not be any record of this. If she was buried in an unmarked grave in a cemetery, there may not be any record of this. Some things that she might try is ask all the elder family members if they know where, you know, great grandma Maddie is, is buried and what kind of stories she can come up with from that. And look at cemeteries where the other relatives are buried to see if you can walk around and look for a gravestone. She may not have had a gravestone. That's the other issue. So sometimes our ancestors don't have a grave site basically that we can visit that, that is identified that we can find. Okay. So you want to make sure you're seeking, you're seeking the death records in the correct place. So could it, could the death have taken place somewhere else than where you thought it should have taken place? Um, so that's one thing. And under which name did the ancestor die? A lot of times I've seen women listed under their maiden names, um, even though they were married or had been married or under the name of a previous husband inexplicably and it, very strange. One of the things you can do is um, search by the date of death for all deaths on that day. That's an option if you know the date of death. Um, and you would do that here at Ancestry. So you would put in under the birth, marriage, and death search page, you would put in the date of death there. And I just made up a date of death, state of death. And you're leaving the names blank. And you're just seeing who died on that day. It would be tedious to go through all of that. But that is a way kind of around them being buried or them be dying under a different name variation or 
possibly being a transcription error from when they were um, transcribing the death certificates. Okay, Elizabeth? Yeah, so this is actually one that I worked on. Um, so disappearing women, uh, women tend to disappear, unfortunately, sometimes in records. So this one I thought was actually kind of interesting. Uh, it says, my brick wall is Joanna Louisa Driscoll, uh, born September 1856 in Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, parents were John and Joanna Driscoll. They were Irish immigrants. Uh, they moved to Providence, Rhode Island in the mid 1870s. Uh, she married a guy named James Henry Kelly on September 21st, 1878 in Providence, Rhode Island. She gave birth to a daughter in December of 1879, also in Providence, Rhode Island. Now that baby dies within a couple weeks. So the baby dies in January, January 4th, 1880 in Providence, Rhode Island. The husband divorces Hannah for desertion and adultery in 1901 to 1902 in Providence. Mary Brown, Hannah, Mary Brown, who is Hannah's older sister, sues Hannah for non-payment of a loan in 1901 to 1902. And between 1882 and 1899, Hannah was arrested and jailed 12 times for being a common drunkard in Providence. All of the events are documented um, in various court records. She uses the name Joanna Driscoll, Hannah L. Driscoll, and Hannah L. Kelly. So this person is looking for, you know, her date of death, where she died, where she's buried, just to kind of complete this, this woman's kind of tragic story. My suggestion for that, uh, which, Sarah, you can actually go to the next slide. Great. Is I would check the, the county or state poorhouse almshouse records. Um, so poorhouses were often a last resort for those who not only had financial problems, uh, maybe they had medical conditions, but other conditions as well, such as alcoholism. Uh, so it's quite possible that Hannah might have been a resident of either the Dexter Asylum, which was outside of Providence, uh, or the state almshouse, and she possibly died there. Uh, the conditions of these facilities were not great. So if she disappeared, it's possible that's where she ended up. Now, as far as finding these records, uh, oftentimes the poorhouse records, because it was the poorhouses were managed by the counties, uh, those records are often still held in the county courthouses unless they were transferred over to some type of state agency like a state library or a state archive or a historical society. Uh, in this particular case, um, the Dexter Asylum's records are located at the Rhode Island Historical Society and the state almshouse records are housed by the Rhode Island Department of State. Sometimes you can find this stuff digitized. Um, it all, the way to figure out, do these things exist? Was there a poorhouse nearby? Start with a Google search. <laughs> Google's your mm -hmm. friend always. Yeah, so that's that's my major recommendations. People always forget those those institutions kind of exist. Yeah, good good thoughts. Okay, let's see. My slides don't like to advance. All right, now we had a bunch of questions that were about pre-revolutionary and revolutionary time periods, and of course, these are difficult time periods to work with, and I you're gonna approach them kind of the same way you approach your other brick walls. You're gonna learn as much as you can about the state at that time period, um, the history, what was going on there, the basic sources for um, that state. And then you're gonna look at the basic genealogical records that we would look, look for um, for anyone. And the research techniques that you're probably gonna to have to use are the fan club, looking for all, all the people of the same surname in the same county and kind of doing some correlating of figuring out who the families are and anal analysis and synthesizing of the records um, using the genealogical proof standard. Um, a lot of that is covered in your handout, what the fan club method is, what the family reconstruction method is. So be sure to look at those in your handout. Here's the question that we're gonna focus on for a few minutes. Okay, so the Browns in Connecticut. 
My brick wall is trying to locate documentation for the parents of Ezra Brown, born in Connecticut, uh, June 9th, 1786. Ezra Brown was married to someone named Mary Bowles. I'm gonna say it's Bowles. Uh, she was born in New London, Connecticut in 1788. Uh, Ezra moved to, this, this is a county I always have issues pronouncing. Susque Susquehanna. Susquehanna, yeah. Thank you. Um, Pennsylvania, and she died there in 1847. His second wife was Lucy Lott. According to a history of Brooklyn, Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, um, Ezra had brothers named Timothy and Roswell. Any help in documenting Ezra Brown's parents would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so when you are in doubt about something, try to find an expert on that field. So actually this is a question that our New England expert answered and um, that's John Beatty. And so I'm gonna read off his response. So he says, we've not been able to find the parents in the extant vital records of Connecticut. So Connecticut had some vital, vital records, but they kind of sloughed off on recording them around the Revolutionary War time period and later, obviously due to the chaos that the war um, created. He then goes on to say the name Roswell is somewhat distinctive, which is good because the last name is Brown. So, um, but the, but the first name Roswell is distinctive. And so there was an earlier Roswell Brown in Stonington, Connecticut. And John suggests that um, you look for connections between your family and that family. Um, Roswell might not be the father, but he might be an uncle, a cousin, something like that. So that's something to look into. Then he suggests the careful sorting of all the Brown families in New London County using the 1790 and 1800 censuses, deed, probate, and court records. Most of those courthouse records have not been put online according to Family Search. When I do a search on Family Search for New London, Connecticut in the catalog, I don't get hits for those records. So, and John didn't either. So we think that a lot of those records from this part of Connecticut have not been digitized, have not been put online. And so unfortunately, to do this kind of reconstruction of all the Brown families in this area of Connecticut, you'll have to either go to Connecticut to do the research herself or hire a researcher. So I know that's bad news, but, um, and then he also said at the very end that Connecticut had a claim to parts of Northeastern Pennsylvania in the early 1800s. And so a lot of Connecticut settlers moved to that area. So that might be why they moved to Pennsylvania. Okay, now we have a whole other set of kinds of questions and we get a lot of these as well, whether, whether there's an immigrant, um, or the person is trying to get started using foreign records. And usually there's a language barrier and some cultural issues maybe going on. And so how do you get going with that? So our first one is an early immigrant actually. Okay, so I am looking for information on James K. Reifenberry, born around 1785 in Germany and residing his lifetime in New Jersey until moving to Auburn, Pennsylvania with his sons, James R. and John C. after the Civil War. He is my brick wall. Hopefully you will find his parents' names and port of entry or how they came to America from Germany. Uh, legend has that they are from Reifenberg, Germany, uh, also known as Ober, Ober Iffenberg, Ober Iffenberg. My German is very poor, guys. I'm sorry. Mine too. Uh, uh, it would be a miracle to trace him back to his parents in Germany. That is the goal, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. So this question was interesting on a number of levels. We have um, somebody who was um, coming over to this country in the 1700s from Germany, and the family actually has a name of a possible village. So that's, that's the interesting part there. Um, often they'll just be kind of some vague um, information and because it's been so long ago that they came over the family, you know, didn't remember what, what, what area they came from in the old country. 
So that was interesting with this one. Um, so again, like I said, I believe in trying to get an expert to help you with these different questions. So I'm Elizabeth and I are not German experts. So John, again, John Beatty are, um, is our German expert here at the library. He knows the most about it of, of the librarians here. And so I went to him and he provided an answer for us. And his basic suggestions were that he thought James, so when, you're, when your ancestor comes over to this country, they often Americanize their name. And so he says, James is not a German name. Like in, in Germany, he would have been known as Jacob because there was no James in Germany. He also, the, the name Reifenberry sounds very Americanized to him. And he's wondering, John's wondering if what it was changed from. And of course, they had the name of the town, which is Reifenberg or Reifenberg or something like that. Is that possibly also the surname of the family? Because it's very similar. So those are John's first suggestions were about the name. So you really need to get a handle on what the family name was back in the old country if it was changed when they came here. I've seen a lot of situations where there's a little bit of confusion over who the immigrant really was. Like a lot of these like old family histories will say that, you know, grandpa came from Scotland, but it was really, it turns out it's like grandpa's grandparents came from Scotland or something like that. So my wonder, my wondering is that maybe this James was not the immigrant. Um, maybe his parents or his grandparents came earlier in an earlier time period. There were a lot of um, Germans coming into Pennsylvania area, maybe New Jersey also um, in the earlier 1700s before the war, before the Revolutionary War. Hard to say though. So you definitely want to look around for, for different um, options. Since this person does have the name of a village, I was, thought I would go ahead and show you what you do if you do know the name of a village. You want to check for whether there's online records for that village, for, for um, the church records, civil records, any kind of records that might have been digitized and put online. The best place to start for that is Family Search at their catalog. You also want to look at the Family Search Wiki, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so the Family Search catalog, you get this at the Family Search website, familysearch.org. You have to have a free account, but it's not hard to do. It takes you about five minutes to set it up. And it is, like I said, a free account. At the catalog search, you're gonna, they want you to type in a place. So this is where you would type in Ober, Ober Reifenberg and Reifenberg, those two towns that we had. When we searched for Reifenberg, we got nothing. So that indicates maybe we don't have the spelling of the village quite right. We'd have, you don't want to do more research on that. Also, it may indicate that that's a very tiny village and they don't have their own church. They don't have their own town hall. And you have to find out where the people from Reifenberg would have gone to church or would have gone to do their government business because that's who would have the records, the next bigger town nearby. Um, so that's where you got to study maps. Yeah. Since you're bringing up the Family Search Catalog, mm -hmm. I wanted mm -hmm. to mention to everybody that when we use Family Search, this is where we live. Is mm -hmm. I, I, I can speak for myself, at least, mm -hmm. is within this catalog. Because when you just search all collections, it's actually not searching all collections because a lot of the digitized stuff on Family Search hasn't been indexed. So that means it's not searchable. So um, somebody had asked in the Q&A, earlier about like, how do I find poorhouse records for this county in Tennessee? And I messaged them back with some information, but to see if there was any that have been digitized, this is how you would do it. Cause a lot of them were on, are on family search, not all, but some. So yeah, I just wanted to hop in and bring that up. That's an important thing. Yes. And I wasn't going to say that. So I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> so what they want you to put in this search box is a place. And normally for the US, you would search by county. But some there are some town records on here as well for US. And then for other countries, you're gonna search by county or by town or by district. 
but it's it's really hard to know like what the district is. So that's where you're gonna need to do more research into that country and how it's organized. So for Ober Reichenberg, we, we put a Reichenberg, we put in that and we do get hits. Now, is this the only village in Germany with that name? I don't know. So that's another consideration. It could be a totally different village. In Germany, there are multiple in Poland and some of the other places over there in the old country, there are multiple villages with the same name. So you're gonna have to kind of sort through that. But there, this is the family search catalog. They've got four headings for this village in Germany. So this is where I would kind of start if you wanted to start looking through these records for possible sites, sightings of your James Reifenbury bird, whatever his name is. I don't know whether any of these records have been digitized. You'd have to click on each one of them, the church records, the civil registration, the history and the public records to see what is online and what is just um, been microfilmed and in the family history library in Salt Lake. Okay, we have another um, foreign records. Yeah, question. even though Puerto Rico is yeah, it's, not, it's not another country. It's, it's, I, know, that's, I know. There are it's a lot of layers records, to that. Yeah, 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 they're not held within mainland the United States. Yeah. That's kind of what yeah. we're getting at. Um, and they're not in English. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, this question is sent me down a major rabbit hole. Um, uh, this person had said that their grandmother, uh, Aurora Alvarez, uh, born 1903, died in 1936, lived in Aguadilla, uh, and she died in San Juan, possibly in a tuberculosis asylum. Uh, her mother was Catalina Al Alvarez, and no one seems to know who her father is. So one of the things that I ended up doing and searching, I ended up the person who asked the question I ended up finding their public tree on ancestry so I was actually able to see what has she been looking at which is very helpful for us as librarians um, to figure out what, what are you seeing when you've been doing your research but the big things that I suggested to this person was the first thing you need to do is figure out what records have survived uh, and what records can you access online and being familiar with the localities, which Sarah mentioned at the beginning of this program as being going back to the top four tips is being familiar with your geography is really, really important because especially in a place like Puerto Rico, those records are held by those mun municipalities. So you need to get into what still exists there. What can you get at now? And a good way to figure out what still exists is going onto the Family Search Research Wiki page, which uh, in a moment, I'll show you a screenshot of what that page looks like for Puerto Rico. But another thing is that Facebook groups can be a really powerful tool. There are Facebook groups for literally anything out there, you guys. So if you did a search for just like Puerto Rican genealogy, you probably, or Puerto Rican family history, you probably could find a group. Uh, and you, there might even be people, if you're not in Puerto Rico, there might even be people there who might know, hey, these records aren't online, but they exist. And they might be able to give you some ideas on how to contact people. As far as records that are online, so there are civil registrations for Puerto Rico. They are on Family Search. Uh, where this particular person was from, not all of the civil registrations. Um, well, actually, no, all the civil registrations are there. It was the Catholic records that are not that are not all online. But I did find a civil registration for someone who could be this person, their their birth, but it's it's kind of hazy. There's some names that kind of match up and not quite. But one thing that I kind of suggested was that since this person potentially died in a tuberculosis sanatorium in San Juan, try searching through San Juan civil records. Uh, so those civil registrations for San Juan are definitely on family search. They are not indexed. So you have to go through image by image to find them. I think I told this person what image number they start on. So at least that would help them a little bit. Um, there might be more information on that civil death 
registration as far as her parents go, but considering she died in a sanatorium, sanatoriums, they oftentimes didn't even know that type of information. So they're going to be a little bit more blank than how it would be if you passed away at home, um, or at least in your, in the town that you lived in. But it never hurts to just look anyway. Um, now, as far as the church records, church records, I suggested that they try to find the baptismal records for this, wo this woman's children. Even though you're trying to find information about her parents, the baptismal records for the Catholic Church can oftentimes include multiple generations. So those for that area are not online, but you can contact the Catholic diocese there and see if the records still exist uh, and if there's a way of maybe finding them. So that's, that's my kind of big suggestions. Silver registration and church records are a big one. DNA might also help. I mean, if we've got this unknown father situation going on. So I DNA. think she had done DNA or because there were people based on some of the trees that I was looking at, the other public trees are kind of connecting with hers. DNA has been done. Mm -hmm. So if you are in this program, uh, if you recognize that this is your question, send us an email. We, we might be able to talk to you about your, your DNA stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's the family search. Yes, that's the family search research wiki page. And, uh, they, there are pages for literally everything. Um, what I really like about them is that, you know, I don't know off the top of my head, you know, exactly what records exist for every single place on the planet, but this will kind of get you started. It gives you research tools. Um, it tells you what's online, hence the big blue arrow at the bottom. And the arrow on the right side of the screen, you can see you can get links to how, how to find things and different research strategies, because how you approach uh, researching in different locations, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be different. Uh, how I would research someone living in New York would be different Sorry. than, it's okay. Um, how I'd research someone who was living in New York will be different than how I'd research someone who was living in Louisiana. So, and that's true for Puerto Rico and other places as well. Yeah, didn't mean to rush you there. I just got no, super fine. happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then we have African-American puzzles. And African-American research can have more challenges than some other types of research. And some of those reasons might be that a lot of times they had very common surnames. Um, they moved around a lot um, for better economic opportunities, so they can't rely on them to have been, stayed in the same community for generations and generations. Name variations. This first example here, this Elijah, is somebody that I actually worked with, and their ancestor was named Elijah. That was his full name. But on every record that we found for this man, and he was African-American, he was using a different nickname for Elijah. And I think all of these were the same name, the same guy, the same name, um, but just versions of the name. And I don't think I've got them all down there. I think there were more that we found. It was just astonishing. This person and I were both just kind of had our jaw drop on the floor by the time we got to the end. There were also last name changes. So sometimes the family right after slavery was using a certain name. And then later on, they transition to use a different name or different siblings that came out of the same family group um, adopted different surnames. So you will find that, you know, the siblings don't have the same original last name. And so that could be confusing, um, like how these people related really. Dates of births and marriages and deaths in the records are approximate um, and changeable. So I've seen where African-Americans and, and some, you know, with other, other groups as well, but I've seen some African-Americans where they're, they're aging 15 years in every census. So the censuses are 10 years apart, but these people are aging 15 years in every census. So that's kind of, you know, not possible. So you've got to be real 
kind of loosey goosey with your um, trying to decide whether this is a record about the same family or not. You want to be broad minded and open minded to the fact that there could be these different variations, different names, different ages, but still the same person. Um, um, mm -hmm. Since you were talking a lot about the, the name variations, um, there was a question about cor like correcting a name. Like a, so you mm -hmm. kind of going back to earlier when you were talking about transcription errors, if you say in Ancestry start searching by change from Justine to Justice, will Ancestry still continue to include Justice? So all of those name variations you're mentioning, you can search through all of those name variations um, there's a way of doing it. I have to actually look at it, but I'm right, right? There, there is a way, yeah, you can still do that. Right. Um, are you talking about Ancestry or? Yeah, on, on Ancestry. Um, I know you can suggest corrections to Ancestry, so the person who was searching for that just justice could, yeah. could suggest to ancestry on that record that that is really just justice instead of justine yeah well i think it, i think they're talking about like alternate names when you change it in the search results will the search results still pull all of those like name variations i think the algorithm will do it 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 usually does, um, even when you don't change it. Does. Yeah. Um, um, I don't think I'm you can like sure tell ancestry. it to. I don't think you could tell it to do it because I think it's already doing it. You can do, yeah, you can do name variations for the first name in Ancestry and see what happens. I don't know how good it is if whether it would get something like this Elijah and Liege and all of that or Lige. Yeah. I, as like kind of an example, I just did a search just now on my end, um, just Lewis Hodges, L-O-U-I-S, and I'm seeing mm -hmm. that first name spelled like that, and then L-E-W-I-S and mm -hmm. L-U-I-S, Louise. Yeah, Ancestry, you don't have to tell it to do it, it'll just do it. Okay. Good. Cool. Sorry. We can move on That's now. Okay. Yeah. Um. So part, another issue that African Americans might run into is that entire communities were missed in certain censuses. Um, and that's been verified. Um, I don't have an exact example, but I know I've heard of that happening where, you know, a certain side of town was missed or a certain neighborhood was missed. And sometimes that affected the African American communities. And then if your family was enslaved, you're going to run into the brick wall of slavery in 1865. And so where things get much more difficult. So let's go ahead to our first African-American puzzle. Okay, so this person said that uh, they are looking for their husband's great, great grandmother, Ada Williams. Uh, the only certain record I have for her is his great grandma's Minnie Ola Jamison's birth certificate at that time, which was 1922. Ada was 22 years old and living in Shreveport, Louisiana, oh, my home state. Uh, I found a death certificate for an Ada Williams of about the right age. She died in Shreveport in 1926. The father is listed as Will Williams. I'm not sure if this is her, but I think it is. It says she was born in Louisiana, but I cannot find her on the census. Yeah. Okay, so this one, we've got a common surname like Williams, which is not going to help us. I think from a little research that I did beforehand, this family may have moved around a bit, so they might not have been originally from Shreveport. So the question is, where in Louisiana was Ada from? We've got an, uh, an orphan situation here where it sounds like Minnie Ola was orphaned as a young child if her mother did pass away. And then, you know, who raised Mineola? Um, so lots of things going on here. My suggestions were basically to do a fan club of Mineola. Like who, who took care of her after her mother died? Um, was it her dad's family? Was it members of her mom's family? 
if you study the fan club and all the different families that are seem to be associated with her, will you find her mother's family? Maybe. The mother and father had to meet somehow. So you can look into that kind of situation. Um, where was the father's family living at about the time period that Mineola was conceived? I don't know. She didn't mention if the couple was married. So I don't know if they were. Um, obviously, a marriage record would be helpful um, to provide further information about them if they were married. DNA would be a help, I think, in this situation. And also, she mentions a death certificate. The Louisiana death certificates are not online, so I couldn't look at the death certificate that she was talking about that she found for Ada. But I wonder how much work she's done on looking at that death certificate and kind of analyzing all the different fields. So I pulled up a different death certificate. This is from the 1920s. It's from Indiana, but I think Louisiana would be a similar format to their death certificate. And kind of put arrows next to some of the fields that you want to pay attention to. So at the very top, we'll start at the top with this top arrow here in the middle. It's saying that this person who died um, was residing at 125 Johnson Street in Fort Wayne, Indiana when they died. So this is information that would be helpful if Ada Williams had that on her death certificate. Um, then you could look up in the city directory who else was living at that household and how were those people possibly related to her. Um, there is a column for whether the person was single, married, widowed, or divorced. So whatever that column says, could lead you to marriage records, divorce records, um, death of a spouse, and so forth. Um, there's a column for date of birth right here. So this could help you figure out maybe a more concise date of birth, knowing that sometimes those are a little off on the death certificate, depending on who's giving the information. There's also a birthplace of deceased right here. So this person happened to be born in Rome, Georgia. Then you have the father's name, birthplace, mother's name, birthplace. Then down here at the very bottom on the left, you have informant. And this is a name and a place and an address actually, Knoxville, Tennessee. This is probably a relative of this person who died. And because they gave the information about the parents, about the birthplace, about the birth date and so forth. So all of those things on Ada Williams' death certificate might be helpful to you to try to track down, is that woman who died in Shreveport the right woman to be Mineola's mother? Then at the very bottom over on the right, we've got place of burial or removal. In this case, this is the name of a cemetery here in Fort Wayne. And so they are a large cemetery. They're still doing burials today. You could call them and get information from their records about burials. This is also the undertaker here and the address of the undertaker. So again, this undertaker information, you could try to track down. This is a closed mortuary from Fort Wayne, but I believe that another mortuary took them over. And so they, they, there are records that exist out there for this mortuary. So again, these are all things in the death certificate of Ada Williams that might give you some clues on how to research this further. I, as someone from Louisiana, I wanna like add a note sure. in here. Mm -hmm. So, if she was born in um, Louisiana, so Louisiana, if she was, um, Louisiana didn't have statewide birth, like birth certificates. The law passed in 1918, and I'm not even really sure when they became fully compliant. Uh, and I believe that the northern parts of the state were a little bit slower to comply. Um, so there were some other birth registers that were done by the individual parishes, um, but not all of them did it and not all of them survived. Uh, the only one that really has like made it is the Orleans Parish one, but yeah, so finding birth records for that area can be kind of tricky, but church records might help, um. Yeah, I just want to throw that out there. So the under like looking into what the laws look like, uh, and that can help inform how you might go about finding some of these records. I just want to point that out. 
Very good. Okay, the next one is an African American question back to slavery. I will read it. Um, we got two brothers. I, I kind of had to distill this way down because there was a lot of information. We got two brothers named Samuel and Benjamin Knox. They were supposedly born in North Carolina, but they moved to Phillips County, Arkansas. Um, their father, according to records that they left behind, was supposedly named Knox, and their mother was named Cowan. Those are the last names. Kenneth, we have some census problems where we can't find Benjamin before 1880, and we can't find Samuel before 1910. So this is kind of typical, but unfortunate because, you know, very few clues to kind of go by. Good clue, Benjamin attended Southland College, which was a Quaker school for ex-slaves in 1880, and that's where he's found in the census. So the suggestions for this person are the records of Southland College. So fortunately, after I Googled, I was able to find um, that these records are held at University of Arkansas in the archives. So this is something to definitely pursue. I also got excited when I saw that there were Quakers involved because the Quakers kept good records, typically. Did the students at that college go to Quaker meetings or were they allowed to go maybe to, you know, a church of their choosing? We don't know, but the Quaker meeting minutes and the records for that particular group of Quakers that were the founders of the college there in Arkansas could have records of the students in the college. We don't know. Um, then we have these two places in North Carolina that the family was supposed to be from, and they are next door to each other. That's um, Iridale County, which is where Statesville is, and Rowan County. Um, we have the two last names that supposedly the family used, Knox and Cowan. We find that there are in the censuses, a lot of Knoxes and Cowans in those counties, both black and white families. Um, none of them named Benjamin or Samuel, unfortunately. That's the problem. Basically, for this question, I think he's the person who posted this is going to have to do a reconstruction of all those families and just start, you know, putting them into family groups. All the white families named Knox, all the black families named Knox, and so forth, with and the Cowans as well, using censuses and then other records. And when, he, when you get back to slavery times, um, you're gonna have to exclusively work on the, um, the Caucasian families with those names, trying to hook up and see whether they had a slave, enslaved boys basically, who could have been Samuel and, and Benjamin or Ben and Sam probably, of the approximate right ages, correct ages. And these records, like the kind of records you're going to have to look for for um, African American for the for the white families, are going to be um, census records, which are online, but estates, wills, deeds, plantation records, if such exist, um, and those are not going to all be online. So it's going to be you can check certainly on Family Search for any digitized records and for book compilations that might comp compile some of these types of records into a book, but a lot of them are gonna be in the courthouses in those two counties, in Iridal and Roan. And the person mentioned that he had done DNA and he said it wasn't helpful. I would kind of question that and say, you know, how much deep analysis of your matches have you done? How much um, listening to like African-American, there's a lot of African-American groups out there right now that are doing um, DNA webinars and uh, podcasts and different things um, that talk about this type of research. And so how to use your DNA results to further back your um, family, your African-American family. So I would kind of research into that and the strategies that you might need to use. And I think the answer might be in your DNA. Um, so I would definitely encourage that. This is what I found when I Googled Southland College. And so I just was going to tell you. So this is the University of Arkansas, the archives, and that's who you would contact. And they say that they had the student record books from 1876 to 1925, which covers the time period that Benjamin was a student there. So I feel pretty good about that. I feel like this is a good solid lead. Okay. 
I have to kind of move a little quickly here. Adoptions, orphans, and unknown fathers. Got a lot of questions about this, and we always do. And these are tough, tough situations to kind of work through. Um, generally speaking, you're going to want to look for what adoption records are available. There's usually statewide records, but sometimes they're county records. Um, you want to look at what orphanage records are available, what social service agency records are available. And in the older adoptions, so let's say 19th century, you're going to look at things like guardianships, bastardy bonds, and court cases um, rather than adoption records. Newspaper accounts, back in the day, a lot of abandoned children, even abuse cases were sometimes written about in the newspaper um, for smaller towns, especially. And DNA, DNA is your friend. Definitely, you know, a DNA um, test of an, a um, descendant of the adopted person, if it was in the last 100, 150 years, will be more successful. So here's our first one. I'm going to preface this by saying, guys, if we do not get to all of your questions in the Q&A, I've been trying to answer some of them as we've been going along. Mm -hmm. Send us an email. Um, we are more than happy to you know, answer all of your wonderful questions. So um, this question, uh, grandfather Walter Henry White, who was born 1882 in Baltimore, Maryland, placed in a Catholic orphanage by his father, not able to find out the orphanage which according to my mother burned down or anything about him until the 1900 census. Okay, so this is probably a case where there's not gonna be official adoption records. And even if there were, um, Maryland, I think is a closed adoption state. So certainly the 20th century adoptions are not available, I don't believe. This is, this is 19th century. So there might be a statute of limitations. You wanna check into that for sure. but. What caught my eye was the word Catholic, kind of like when I when we talked about the Quakers, um, Catholics also kept very good records, generally speaking. So I if this if this part of the story is really true and, you know, a lot of these are family stories that have been related. And so there could be some elements of truth and some elements of maybe misremembering some of the facts. But um, if they were in a Catholic, if he was in a Catholic orphanage, there should be records. And so one of the first things that I did was Google, because Google's our friend, um, the Catholic Archdiocese of Baltimore. And when I'm going through their website, I'm looking for the ar archives, I'm looking for records, I'm looking for those kind of keywords. And through a series of clicking through different pages, I found this page, which tells me what to do about orphanage records. It says, we don't have them, but we gave them to the associated Catholic charities. And it tells you how to contact them. So that's what you need to do um, for this particular question. And I hope that they have some records of the orphanage that this boy was sent to. But DNA is the other um, solution. So the woman who um, submitted this question is the granddaughter of Walter. So when, oh, I didn't, I took that out. Okay. So basically this is in your handout somewhat, but basically she gets her DNA re results back. Um, she's the granddaughter. She's going to have matches to her father's side of the family, which are not related to this side of the family at all. And she's going to mark them um, off as father's side of the family. Then she's going to have matches to her maternal grandmother's side of the family. And that is the woman who married Walter. And so those matches are going to be, you know, not relevant. So she would mark those off as well. She should have leftover matches that are not from the father's side, not from the maternal grandmother's side. Those are going to be from Walter's side of the family. And then you would work with those particular matches to try to figure out, you know, are they named white? They might not be. They might be a total different surname. I mean, that kind of thing has happened, you know, where the surname doesn't seem to be correct. Um, but that's what you want to do with her DNA matches. And I'm already in contact with this woman. So we're kind of working on her DNA. Okay, the last one, let's kind of just try to power through this. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, first, thank you for your assistance uh, available. I have searched for many years to find out who were my two times great grandmother's parents? Um, 
so this person's two times great grandmother was Diana Elizabeth Wright, born sometime in 1837 in Illinois. If the census, if the 18 census, 1850 census is to be believed, uh, she was 13 in 1850, living with the Worley family. Although I have yet to make any familial connection between them. September 1856, Diana married James W. Roberts, and I have a great deal of information about her. Uh, once she's married and living in Lewiston, Illinois, and she died September 1st, 1899 in Cook County, Illinois. So again, I'm trying to push my knowledge of my family further back and need some help in finding who were Diana's parents. Uh, the father supposedly came from Scotland, married an Irish woman in Richmond, Virginia. And thanks for your possible assistance. Okay, so... This is an earlier situation. It may be that this girl was an orphan. We don't really know why she's living at the age of 13 with another family. We have a family story, which may or may not be true. So you can look through the different records looking for a father from Scotland and a mother from Virginia who's Irish, but know that that part might be a little bit shaky. It's you know based on family story from 200 years ago. Um, so, I had a couple suggestions. I think DNA is certainly still an option, even this far back. Um, and you would do the same kind of process of elimination where you would look at your matches for the different sides of the family, eliminate the ones from the sides of the family that you already know and look for um, unknown people in your match list and see if they could be related to Diana's side of the family. Um, Another thing I think that'll be helpful for this person would be the fan club for Diana, her husband, her kids, her in-laws, and also a study of all the people named Wright in Fulton County, Illinois. She didn't get to Fulton County, Illinois on her own. She had to be taken there probably by a relative, I would say. So I would think that she has some kind of connection. Her, her family links her somehow to Fulton County, Illinois, which is where she's living in 1850. So maybe she's not related to the Whirlies, we don't know, but um, that's certainly something to keep looking into. Why was she living with that family? But looking at all the rights and kind of reconstructing who they all were and seeing if you could fit her into one of the, the family, um, maybe you know, see a, a, a male man whose last name was Wright who dies a couple of years after 1837, you know, that could, you could work on the theory that he could have been her father and that's why she had to be um, adopted into another family or fostered into another family. So lots of things to do. This person did not mention all the types of records that they had already consulted. So I just made a list here of the types of records that could lead you back to her parents' names. Um, her marriage record might have listed her parents' names. Her death record might have listed her parents' names. Her obituary might have listed some family connections a funeral home record, a cemetery record, call the office. I know she was buried in a large cemetery in Chicago that I think would have a cemetery office with records, um, church records, if you knew what church she was married in or that she attended as an adult with her children and husband. Um, even the records of her children might list their grandparents' names somewhere. So really do kind of a deep dive into that. And then in Fulton County, there are a great deal of records that could have been created about around her being orphaned. So if she really was orphaned, there might be a guardianship record, they might be an apprenticeship record, poor house that she might've been sent to, um, court records, that type of thing. So hopefully that is helpful. Um, and I think that we will wrap it up here.